Hello, and welcome back for another video in the College Algebra series. In this video, we're going to focus on graphs of logarithmic functions. Now, we've already talked about exponential functions, and we talked about their graphs. So now we're going to be talking about the graphs of the inverse functions. We've also talked about logarithms. And remember, the logarithm is the power that you're raising the base to to get the answer part. So it's read sort of this backward C motion. So the inverse function to an exponential is the logarithm function. So the graphs are mirror images across the identity function, y equal x. And that's because if you swap x and y, you still get y equal x or x equal y. And if you swap the ordered pairs, 2, 2 swapped is still 2, 2. And when you fold it on itself, of course, it matches up to itself. We're going to see that when we fold the logarithmic graph and the exponential graph across that identity function, y equal x, they actually meet up and touch one another. We saw this in a previous video when we were talking about the logarithmic function. But now we're really going to focus on these logarithmic functions and how to shift them up, down, left, right, stretch them, compress them. So let me share my screen with you and we'll get started. Okay, so what you're seeing here now is basically a graph of both the exponential function y equal two to the x and the graph of the logarithmic function, y equals log base two of x here in red. So when we look at these two graphs, the identity function is that line of slope one that goes through the origin, y equal x, and it's pictured here in a dashed purple line. So when we fold on this dashed purple line, on this diagonal line, then we find that the blue curve and the red curve here actually match up. They touch, and that's because they're mirror images of each other across that identity function. And we see that the ordered pairs also swap positions. So if the ordered pair is one comma two on the exponential function, meaning two raised to the first power gives you two. So when X is one, Y is two on the logarithm function, the ordered pair will be two comma one. The log base two of two equals one because two to the first power gives us back the two. All right, so we can see that each ordered pair has been swapped here. And the inverse notation for the inverse function of an exponential is the logarithm with the same base. Now remember, because the base is strictly positive and never one, that means that the answer part here is also strictly positive and never one. And so we see right here that this answer part has to be strictly positive. So when we're looking at this, actually, I said that backwards, this can be one. This will be one only when the power is zero. So when we're looking at this over here, this answer part, which is x in the logarithmic equation, is corresponding to the y in the exponential equation. So in the exponential equation, the range is open zero to infinity. And here in the logarithmic equation, it's the domain, which again is open zero to infinity. In other words, the answer part can be any strictly positive number, but it cannot be zero and it cannot be negative. And that's because we're taking a strictly positive number and raising it to a power. And that will never turn it negative. And as long as the number as a base is not zero, we can't get zero either. Now we can get one. How do we get one? So that would be right here. Well, when is two raised to a power equal to one? Only when the power is zero. So when y is zero, we know that the answer part will be one because two to the zeroth power gives us one. And so that will give us this ordered pair that you see down here when x is one, y is zero. It's not marked in this picture. So this is the one that we wanna focus on today, which is the logarithm function. So I've reproduced it for you here so that we can look at it a little bit more closely. So let me blow it up a little bit 
so we can make it a little bit bigger so we can see it a little better. So when we're looking at this one right here, let's notice some things about the graph. Now it is the inverse function to the exponential, so it has some of the same characteristics. For example, the base is strictly positive and the base is not one. And because of that, the answer parts are always strictly um, positive. And we can um, see that the power, however, can be anything, right? We can use a positive, a negative, zero, anything for the power, right? So in the exponential, the power is the domain, the x value. But in the logarithmic, the power is the y value, the output. Both functions are one-to-one -one functions, which means that when you look at the graph, they both pass the vertical line test that makes them a function, but they also pass the horizontal line test. So when you draw horizontal lines coming down the graph and you never intersect it more than one time, you might miss it totally, but you don't hit it more than once, then you know that it's a one-to-one -one function. That means every X has exactly one Y value and every Y that gets used has exactly one X that it comes from. In the graph here of this logarithmic function, you can see that it gets super, super close to the Y axis, um, the negative Y axis to be specific. Now the equation for that is the vertical line X equals zero. So it has a vertical asymptote of X equals zero. Now, when we're looking at that, what's that mean? I mean, what's that X again? When we look at the equation, the X is the answer part. Again, we're taking the base number and raising it to the Y power, and that's giving us the answer of X. So when we're looking at this, if the base is a positive number, and not one because that just gives us the horizontal line Y equal one, then it's impossible to come up with zero for the value. And that is reflected in the graph by the fact that it gets very, very, very close to the y-axis down on the negative part, but it never touches and it never crosses unless we shift it. If we pick the whole thing up and move it over to the left, then we can get it to cross. Now the domain is gonna be then all the values from open zero to infinity. So looking down here, we'll see that the domain goes from open zero to infinity. Now, the range is a little bit different. The range is what the y value, the output could be. And in a logarithm equation, the output is the exponent, the power itself. Log is exponent. So the log is the power. Log equals power. So when we're looking at that, the powers are allowed to be anything. They're the only thing that's allowed to have any value whatsoever in the real number system with no restrictions. Okay? The base has to be strictly positive and not one. The answer part becomes strictly positive. It can be one. And then the powers anything goes as long as it's real. So when we're looking at this, notice that the y values go down to negative infinity. And then this is growing. It is increasing. It is still sloping uphill, but it grows very, very slowly. It does go to infinity. It's the slowest class of functions that we study um, in college algebra and even in calculus. It's the slowest class of functions that does go to infinity as X goes to infinity. So the range is going to be negative infinity to infinity. Now they do have an X intercept of one zero and a key point of B one. So when we're looking at that, why do they have this point one zero? So let's take a look at that. So why would we have the ordered pair one zero? If we look at the equation that we have right here, boxed in blue, then this means that the log base two below and to the right of X, which is one equals zero. And again, remember that we read this in sort of this backward C motion when you have the equal sign on the left, two to the zeroth power equals one, right? So we have two to the zeroth equals one. Well, any positive number raised to the zeroth power is one. So all of these, regardless of the base, are gonna go through the ordered pair one zero, unless of course we shift it up, down, left, or right. Now, the other point that it's gonna go through is B 
one. So in our case, because our base is a two, what you see right here, we know that it has to go through the ordered pair two comma one. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is the X coordinate and this is the Y coordinate. So what it says is the log base two of X, which is two, that's this two, equals the Y value, which is one. Well, that makes sense because again, we're gonna read it in this backward C, two to the first power gives me two. And that makes sense. So every one of these logarithmic equations is going to go through the ordered pair b comma one, where b is that positive base not equal to one. Now, the last two characteristics that we wanna talk about is that there's no y-intercept because again, the answer part um, in the logarithm equation cannot be zero. We're taking a positive number and raising it to a power and so because we take this positive to a power, we can't get zero here for the answer. So we're not gonna have any y-intercepts unless we shift it to the left. Now, the next thing that we wanna see is it's increasing if b is greater than one and decreasing if b is between zero and one. So remember, we have this restriction on our bases. The base has to be, um, greater than zero and not equal to one. So what does that really mean? Well, that means it can be between zero and one, and it can be from one to infinity, but it can't be outside that. Well, the numbers where it's between zero and one, it's a proper fraction, like one half or two thirds or four fifths, with the numerator smaller than the denominator. If it's between one and infinity, of course, it's greater than one, so written as a fraction, it would be improper. So when you're looking at this, this determines the shape of the graph. So if the base is between zero and one, it looks a little different than the one we have pictured here. The one we have pictured here is for the base greater than one. Our base is two, so the base here is greater than one and it gives it this sort of um, upward growing characteristic. So what does it look like if the base is between zero and one? Well, if it's between zero and one, then it looks like the graph here that you see on the right. So when B is greater than one, it grows and skims along the negative Y axis, crosses the X axis at one zero, goes through the ordered pair whatever the base value is, comma one, and then it continues to grow. But if the number that we're using for the base is between zero and one, like base one half or base two thirds, then it's actually gonna come down the positive Y axis. It still goes through the ordered pair B one. It still goes through the ordered pair one zero, but then it goes below the X axis and curves out this way. So this one is decreasing over the domain, and this one is increasing over the domain. And the way to determine increasing and decreasing is you read the graph from the left side to the right side. So if you park something on the left side and you push it to the right along the curve, it's generally going up, then it's increasing. And if it's generally going down, it's decreasing. Now I've given you some examples here of different kinds of graph. The textbook had examples of one where the base was greater than one. So let's review what this is again from our logarithm section. If you don't write the base, but you write LOG, then the base is understood to be 10. If you write LN, the base is understood to be Euler's number, which of course is about 2.718281828459. It's irrational. It never repeats and it has no pattern, right? So, and it never stops. And then this one is the log base two. Now, what do you notice about these? Well, for one thing, I noticed that as the base decreases in value 10 to about 2.7 to two, it's actually kind of rising higher. It's like almost like it's getting stretched. 
So the closer it is to one, but greater than one, the more stretch the graph has. Now, if we look at the situation where B is between zero and one, so now we have the situation where it's between zero and one, so these are all proper fractions here. When we're looking at these, let's compare what happens and see if we have the same pattern. And what you find here is this, of course, is the base one fifth. So you can write here one fifth is actually equal to 0 0.2. And this is base one half, which is 0 0.5. And this is base four fifths, which is 0 0.8. Right? This almost has the reverse situation going on. In this case, the closer it is to one, but the larger the value, the more stretched it is. And in this case, when it gets smaller, it becomes more compressed. Over here, it was the larger base on the left that made it more compressed vertically. And over here, it's the smallest base that makes it compressed. So one way of thinking about it is when the value of the base is getting closer to one from either side, it's stretching the graph out. So these go 10, E, two, it's getting closer to one. So it's stretching up and this is one fifth, one half, four fifths. It's getting closer to one as it gets closer to one, it stretches the graph out. All right, now, how do you graph a logarithm function? Well, the first thing you wanna do is start with that vertical asymptote. If it has not been shifted to the left or to the right, um, then your vertical asymptote is going to be the y-axis, x equals zero. Then you will wanna plot the x-intercept, one zero, and then you will want to um, plot the key point b comma one, draw a smooth curve. Remember that the domain is um, strictly positive reals and the range is all reals and graph it from there. Now we want to take a look at shifts. Okay, so I said that they're all going to go through the point 0, 1 or B1 unless we shift it. So, and they don't have a Y intercept unless we shift it left. So, if we shift it to the left, left and right affect X, and X is inside the logarithm in the answer part. And so the shift has to be inside the logarithm next to the X. And because it's close to the X, it does the opposite of what we expect. So if C is a positive number, so if this is something like, well, let's say log base two of X plus three, then this is actually going to shift left three, right? So Instead of going to the right, which is what we normally think of as a plus, it actually went to the left. Okay? Now over here, if we have the same graph, log base two, and we have X minus four, then this actually shifts right by four. Now, if we shift right four, everything shifts to the right four. So instead of going through one zero, it will now go through five zero because I shifted it to the right, one plus four is five. And instead of going through two one, it will go through six one because every X coordinate got shifted to the right by four. It also shifts the vertical asymptote. So instead of being the X axis or Y axis, X equals zero, it becomes the vertical line X equal four in this case. Over here, it would become the vertical line x equal negative three. And you can see that if you shift it to the left, then we do suddenly get a y-intercept, right? So it's possible to get a y-intercept when you shift these graphs to the left, right? Now, let's see what else changes. It does change the domain from whatever the shift was. If it's left, it goes from that negative value to infinity. And if it's to the right, for example, on this one, it would go from four to infinity. But the range doesn't change, it's still all reals. 
So here are some guidelines on how you're going to do the shifts if you have a shift left or right. Now, the thing to remember is left to right is controlled by X. So it's got to be inside the answer part. So it's got to be inside parentheses right next to X. And the formula is actually X minus a number. And so that's why it does the opposite. So when we're looking at this, if it says X plus three, it goes left three. If it says X minus four, it goes right four, right? Which is a little confusing. Okay, and then you can go ahead and graph that there. Remember that everything is gonna shift by that amount. The vertical asymptote shifts by that amount, the X intercept shifts by that amount, and that ordered pair B comma one shifts left or right by that amount as well. Okay. Now let's talk about a shift up or down. So when we're looking at a shift up or down, up and down is affected by Y. That's what Y does, it controls the vertical. And so this is affecting the Y coordinate, but notice that when we write the equation, the function notation is actually representing the Y. And so if I have something over here that says, I don't know, plus two, something like that, let's suppose that this is log base four, all right, of X plus two. The X is the only thing inside the logarithm, right? It's a good habit to put parentheses around it, but even without them, the plus two is not inside the answer part unless it's enclosed in parentheses. This does not equal this. This is a shift left to, and this is a shift up to. So where the parentheses are makes a huge difference. Now you'll notice that although this affects the Y, it does what you think it would do. A plus two moves it up to and a minus two would move it down to. Why? Why is the X the opposite and Y the same? Well, that's because the two isn't sitting next to the Y. If I were to move the two to the other side of the equation, then it would say y minus two equals the log base four of x. Well, when it's sitting next to the variable it affects, it's always the opposite. And so this is still up two. It's just that now the two is sitting right next to the y. So we do the opposite of what we expect. Now, when we shift it up or down, it is not going to change the vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote is going to stay the y-axis, x equal to zero. It will, however, change the x-intercept and it will change that value of b comma one because it's gonna shift. It's gonna go up by that amount or down by that amount. So when we look right here, we can see that when we shift it, for example, up, we can see that the x-intercept got pushed over because this point one zero is now up above. So this point one zero has now been shifted up here. And this amount right here is the shift up two, for example, right? If we're having that on there. And then over here on this one, as we look at the one on the right, it's been pulled down but notice that it still has the y-axis x equals zero as the vertical asymptote. The domain has not changed. It's still zero to infinity and not including zero. And the range hasn't changed. It's still all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. So when we graph these, you can see the different relationships here. It's just shifting all the points, the Y values up by that amount or down by that amount. Great. Now let's talk about a vertical stretch or compression. These are a little bit more difficult. When we do a vertical stretch, a translation left, right, up, down. These are like peeling off a sticker and putting it down somewhere else. The sticker maintains exactly the same shape. It's just in a new location. When you do a vertical stretch or compression or a horizontal stretch or compression, this changes the shape of that sticker. So you're actually stretching it like taffy or you're compressing it like taffy. 
this is like an arm, you know, Armstrong, whatever toy that we used to have. So when you're looking at this, look at this graph here on the left, you can see the graph log base B of X is the original parent function. And what we did was we multiplied it by a value of A that was greater than one. So if we multiply it by A that is greater than one, then what that does is it stretches the graph. So it pulls it. So it's, it's basically taking each value, each Y value and multiplying it by something, not adding to it like we saw in a shift up where we add the Y value each time. Now it's multiplying each Y value by some factor A. In this case, notice that the asymptote is going to stay the y-axis, x equals zero. Notice that the x-intercept actually doesn't change, right? So it's going to stay one zero. Um, but, uh, and the domain doesn't change and the range doesn't change. But it does make it go slower down here and faster up here in a sense. Now, what about this one? This is a compression. So it's actually been sort of squashed vertically. So when we look at this, notice that we have one over A. In other words, this is a proper fraction, something between zero and one. So you're multiplying the logarithm by like four fifths or two thirds or one third or one fifth. You're taking each Y value and multiplying it by that number. So you're compressing the graph vertically. And that will give you this graph right here. Notice that it does give us different points on the graph. This translates the points a little bit. I don't expect my students to necessarily know these. I think it's great if you do, but I think this is kind of pushing the edges of what I expect my students to know. So again, I don't expect you to know that the point B comma one goes to B to the A comma one. I don't expect you to figure that out. Right, And here are some directions on how you want to graph if you have a vertical stretch or compression. You're going to stretch it if what you're multiplying by is a number greater than one, and you're going to compress it if the number is a proper fraction between zero and one. Right. Now let's take a look about to reflections. Now, what is a reflection? Well, that's if that multiplicative factor that we we're just talking about, that, that compression or stretch factor is negative. So what does the negative do? Well, if you sort of separate the two, the magnitude either stretches if the magnitude is greater than one or compresses if it's between zero and one. The negative reflects it, right? So it takes every y value and multiplies by a negative. So it's going to reflect it. So if we have one that is growing because the base is greater than one. So in this graph right here, we do have the base being greater than one. Then when we reflect it by multiplying by a negative, you can see that right here it's going to reflect across the x-axis. So what you're gonna do is you're actually gonna take this axis right here and you're gonna fold the graph on that, like you put paint on the blue line, and then you're gonna fold it and see where it makes an imprint. And the imprint of it, of course, is gonna be coming right down here. This is gonna be the mirror image of it when you fold on the x-axis. That means that you've multiplied each y value by a negative, so it just reflects it. If it was in quadrant one, now it's in quadrant four. If it was in quadrant four, now it's in quadrant one. Now, what about this graph over here on the right? Oops, and I meant to write up here, b is greater than one. What about this graph on the right? It's not reflected across the x-axis. And I know that because when I look at the reflection here, if I fold on that yellow line, these don't match up, not at all. But if I change which one I'm folding on and I make it the y-axis, now they do. So this is a horizontal fold here. So it's affecting x. I'm folding across the y-axis, but it's actually changing the x values. So it affects x, so we're gonna see that it is inside the main operation 
multiplied by the x. Now we have to be careful with these. Let's suppose that we had the equation y equals, well, let's just do natural log for ease. And I had something like negative x plus two. Now, a lot of students wanna say, okay, it's been reflected across the y-axis because the x is negative, and it's been shifted left to because it's got a plus two. The problem is you have to separate the reflection from the shift. And the only way to separate the reflection from the shift is to then take that negative and factor it off. And when you factor it out of those last two terms, what was a plus two now becomes a minus two. So this has actually been shifted right to And then it's been reflected across the y-axis. A horizontal reflection, right? So when we reflect across the x-axis, we call it a vertical reflection. Now notice that these do change some of the aspects of the graph. So when we look at the vertical reflection, when we multiply on the outside by a negative and the outside of course affects the y value, then what it's gonna do, it's not gonna change the asymptote, it remains the y axis. It doesn't change the x intercept, but it does change that key point right here um, where we've got this b1, then over here we would have b to the negative one, one. Right, and we can see they're reflected right here. It does not affect the domain and it does not affect the range. When we reflect horizontally across the y-axis, the asymptote again does not change. It remains the y-axis x equal to zero, but it does change the x-intercept from one zero to negative one zero. And it changes that key point from b comma one to negative b one. It's just making an imprint on the other side of the y-axis. Notice that it also changes the domain. So this is something that is very different and that we have not seen too often before. It changes the domain from zero to infinity to negative infinity to zero. So here are some of the guidelines for reflections. Now, students struggle the most with the reflections across the y-axis, the horizontal one. And of course, because they're more difficult. As we saw in the previous material, in order to know which way it's really been shifted, you have to factor the negative off of the answer part. And then you can see that it's actually been shifted to the right and then reflected, right? So what we want to do then is we want to put all of this sort of together. So if you've got some directions, these are directions for um, graphing with a reflection. This is just a general table that goes through some of the changes that we've talked about. This is moving horizontally C units to the left or D units up. That gives you an equation that looks like this again. So what we've got here is plus C that is actually going to go to the left. If it were minus C, it would go to the right. Plus D goes up, minus D goes down. If we multiply by A and A is bigger than one, then it stretches the graph vertically. And if we multiply by A and A is between zero and one, then it compresses it. If A is a negative, then it reflects it across the y-axis. So it makes a mirror image this way. So it's like twisting the um, x-axis and flipping it 180 degrees. If we multiply inside the answer part by a negative, in order to know the shift left or right, we have to factor it out of the inside part. And then what we do is we look at it as a reflection horizontally. So it's been reflected this way instead, which is far more difficult. And then we can look at something like this where we have all possible changes included. Okay. 
So now let's go ahead and take a look at our first problem here. We want to take a look at what is the domain and what is the range and how can we find that just by looking at the equation. So let's remind ourselves of some of the rules that we have here. B has to be greater than zero and not equal to one. So that's a rule. And the answer parts, what's inside the logarithm has to be strictly greater than zero, all right? It can be one if the power is zero. The power just has to be a real number, any real number, positive, negative, zero, fractions, decimals, irrational, anything, okay? So when we're looking at this equation right here, we have natural log of six minus X, and this can be equal to Y. So when we're looking at this right here, the base is not written, but we wrote LN, so the base is E, and the answer part is six minus X. Now that has to be strictly greater than zero. So we take the six minus X out and we say, you have to be greater than zero. Whatever you are, you have to be bigger than zero. And then we isolate the X. So the easiest way to isolate X is to move X to the opposite side. And then we get six is greater than X, which means that the X, the variable that we're looking at right here is on the narrow end of the symbol. If you turned it around, this says six is bigger than X, but you could also turn it around and say X is smaller than six. In both of these versions, the six is on the wide end, indicating it is the thing on the right, and the variable X is on the little end, indicating it's the thing on the left. So when we're looking at our domain here and we're looking at the real number line, then we can have zero just for a reference, and the number six is up here, and the variable X is on the left side of the symbol, the little end, so we're going to have an open circle at six because it cannot be equal to zero. So it can't be equal to six. And then we're going to go to the left, little end, go left. If the variables on the little end, go left. If the variables on the wide end, go to the right where the bigger numbers are. And we get this situation here. Now, how do we turn this into interval notation for the domain? Well, this is going to start on the left end which goes forever, so that would be negative infinity. Always use round parentheses with infinity and negative infinity. And it stops at six, but I don't want to include six. So I take half of that open circle and use it as a round parentheses. So this gives me negative infinity to six. Now, there's not much that affects the range. The range goes from negative infinity to infinity. So this just took the whole graph and it shifted it. Now, which way did it shift it? And how did it shift it? And oh my gosh, what happened here? Okay, so I've got the domain. The range probably is the same, negative infinity to infinity. You can get anything coming out of this. If I turn this equation around a little bit and I wanna look at it from another standpoint, I could write this as natural log of negative x plus six. So if I'm trying to figure out what happened to this graph, what actually, what steps were taken, I can see the X is multiplied by a negative, which tells me I've got one of these more difficult horizontal reflections across the Y axis. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna factor that negative off the terms inside the answer part, and that's gonna give me X minus six. So this thing has actually been shifted to the right and then reflected across the y-axis. So I'm going to click on my link here and then we'll see what it looks like inside of Desmos. So now you can see here in Desmos, this is what the graph looks like. You may look at this and go, oh, I'm not seeing where that came from, all right? I'm not seeing how it started and how it got to there. So let's go through the steps of what happened. So we start with the parent function. Let me make the parent function a different color. So I'll make it blue. So we started with that. And then according to the order of operations, what you see here, the next thing that had to happen inside parentheses was it got shifted to the right. So I did X minus six. 
So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in natural log parentheses x minus 6, close parentheses, and I need to change the color again. I keep picking bad colors. So we'll make this one black so we can see that one there. Now, if I'm looking at this one here and I'm going to take the parent function off. So I started with the parent function and I shifted it to the right six. Does everybody see that this is the same graph just picked up and put down six to the right. So this ordered pair that was right here, which is one zero, went to this point right here. You add six to one and you get seven. Okay? So then what we did was we reflected it across the y-axis. So we did a reflection. And after we reflected it, we got the new graph. So let me take the parent function off. And now what we're looking at is the reflection. So you can see it got reflected last across this line, um, x equal to six. All right. So now the next thing that we want to take a look at here is doing the same thing, but for a different function. This is log of x minus one. So when we're looking at this particular graph, we want to find the domain and the vertical asymptote. So the vertical asymptote, those are the values um, that represent the answer parts, what the answer part cannot be, which typically is zero. Okay? So when we're looking at this, what we're going to see right here, the domain, we're going to take the log and it says LOG, but it didn't list a base. So when it writes LOG, understand that the base is actually 10 and it's better notation to go ahead and write the 10 nowadays. And this is equal to Y. This is our answer part. And remember that that answer part has to be strictly greater than zero. It cannot come out to be zero or negative. And so once I have this, then I'm going to go ahead and isolate the x by moving the 1 to the opposite side of the inequality, and I get x is greater than 1. So when I'm looking at this here, again, what's happening is it's inside the main operation. It's sitting next to x inside the logarithm. So this is a shift left or right, and because it's minus 1, this is actually a shift right 1. Okay. So this tells me that x has to go from open one to infinity. So again, when I do my number line here, and if I put down zero, and these don't have to be to scale, I know it can't be zero. So empty circle, the variable this time is on the wide end. So I go to the right. So this becomes the domain open one to positive infinity, right? Now, what happened then to the graph? The whole graph got shifted right one. So in the old graph, what we were looking at was something that did this. And then the whole thing got shifted right one. So everything got moved over like this. Everything, right? The whole thing got peeled off and set back down over one. So let's take a look at what this one looks like in Desmos. Right. Give it a second to graph and you can see there's the natural log of X. And if I do another one, if I do the parent function and shows up, then you can see right here that this is the parent function. You've got the point one zero, and then this one moved to the right, which is gonna give me um, two zero instead. But actually, I think it was supposed to be log, wasn't it? Um, let's go ahead and change that and put in LOG. That's going to change our graph a little bit because the base became bigger. It's going to compress it vertically. And so now we have these points right here, which you can see coming out here. Right? And again, we know because the base is 10, we should have one of them at 10, 1. Oh, so Desmos is messing up a little bit out here. Um, it's messing up, not quite getting right on the right one, or I may be on the wrong graph, which is also possible, right? It's putting me on the opposite graph, okay? Now let's take a look at the next problem. 
find the domain and vertical asymptotes for this one. Now, this problem has a lot of changes. We have a negative on the outside, which represents a vertical reflection. We have a minus six inside the logarithm, that's a shift to the right, and a plus seven outside the logarithm, that's a shift up. So let's go ahead and list all of these changes that have happened here. So this is reflected vertically across the x-axis. And this one has been shifted right six. And this moves it up seven, right? So what's the new domain? What affects the domain? What affects the domain is the answer part, the part that's inside the main operation. So again, we have this X minus six in here. So X minus six, the answer part has to be strictly positive, which means X has to be greater than six, which on the number line, again, is gonna give me from six to infinity. So I can write the domain like this. So my domain is gonna be from six to infinity, which means everything got shifted to the right. So my vertical asymptote, which was X equals zero, is now X equal to six, okay? So let's take a look at what this one looks like. And remember, it's also been reflected um, vertically. So here we go. So looking at this graph right here, let's see what happened. So it got moved from here and it got moved right um, six. So everything moved over. Did I have this one in here, right? Yeah. Okay, and it got moved over to the right. And then when I look at the next part of it, um, right here, it was a little harder to see that it was six. So I scrolled in a little bit. So you can see right here, it's crossing now at six zero instead of at one zero. And then it would have gotten shifted up seven, which would have put it up here. And then it got reflected, everything got pushed over the axis. So let's look at each of these steps in turn. So we're gonna start with log of X minus six. And this has to go in parentheses because it's the answer part. So we can see that we've got the X minus six. So this is the parent function shifted right six. And then let's do that one shifted up seven. So log of X minus six plus seven. So now it's been up seven and I need to change the color so it doesn't blend in with the other one. There it is. See how it took this red curve and just pushed every point, point by point up seven, the Y value you add seven to shift up. And then it took this graph right here. I'm gonna turn this one off. It took this graph and it reflected it. So I'm gonna kind of scroll in a little bit so you can see it. It took the graph and it reflected it. So instead of this Y value at 7.301, it's gonna come down here to, oops, if I can get it to sit, eight to negative 7.301. So it's the same points, just the Y value has been multiplied by a negative. And that will give us the graph. Okay, so our vertical asymptote, again, it was from the shift. So it got shifted over to X equals six, right? Now let's take a look at the next one. This is based on a natural logarithm. So inside here, it's inside the answer part. So it affects X, so it's a left or right shift. It's a positive X, so it's not been reflected. And the base is E, so it is definitely growing. It's going up. It's not one where the base is between zero and one where it's coming down. Um, this one is growing, which is more commonly what we work with. But the minus seven is next to X, so we do the opposite. Instead of going left, we go right seven. So this is everything got shifted to the right by seven which basically means that my 
vertical asymptote goes from x equals zero to x equals seven, right? So I know this is gonna go over here to x equals seven. Now I don't have to do the work, but I can do the work. I can show that the domain has to be seven to infinity because again, this answer part inside the logarithm must be greater than zero. And that's how I'm gonna find the domain. So this tells me that X has to be greater than seven, which on the number line is going to graph as an empty circle at seven and the variables on the opened end. So we go right, which is seven to infinity. And let's take a look at what this one looks like. I can get it to graph and hopefully I didn't forget and make it log. I did not, it's natural log. So you can see it right here and you can see that it is approaching the value of seven, but it will never get there. It cannot actually be seven, right? That's undefined, okay? So we've got everything coming down. And then um, I think that's pretty much it to talk about for that one. So let's move on to the next problem, which is number five. And number five, we're supposed to tell which graph is which by looking at this. Now they all have to have a base greater than one. How do I know that? Because they're growing, right? They're generally increasing. When the base is greater than one, it increases. When the base is between zero and one, a fraction, a proper fraction, it decreases, it comes down like this, right? Now, the other thing that we said was, as the number of the base gets larger, the base gets compressed vertically. So the larger the base, the more vertical compression we have. The closer the base is to one, greater than one, but closer to one, the more stretched the graph becomes. So for here, if I'm looking at graph E on the graph, I'm looking for the largest base. So I come over here and I look at my list. This just says log, so it must be base 10. Natural log is base E, which is about 2.7-ish. And I have a base two, a base five, and a base 25. Well, the largest base has to be the most vertically compressed. So this has to be graph E. And then the next most vertically compressed would be D. And the next largest is log base five. So this has to be D. Now the next one, of course, is gonna be C, but 2.7 is bigger than two. So don't just go in order. So this one is going to be C. And then log base two is, oops, I missed the 10. Scratch, go back. Log base 10, I forgot I had a base 10 up there. Log base 10, 10 is the second largest, so that's got to be D. And then C has got to be log base 5. And then B has to be the natural log and the one with the smallest base that's still greater than 1 is going to be graph A, the one that is most vertically stretched. Okay, let's take a look at the next problem. So in this one, we're asked to determine which one is the graph of log base two of x plus one. The base is two, which is greater than one, so it's gotta be a growing. Now it could be reflected, right? But it's gotta be growing, all right? So it's gotta be coming up. In other words, it can't be one of the ones that comes down like this. This is a no, okay? So it's not one of those. Now, what happened here? Well, it's inside the main operation, the logarithm. It's a part of the answer part. So it's a left-right shift. And because it's a plus one, it actually went left one. So it's the graph of the whole thing, but it went left by one. So it should have come up along the negative y-axis. It should have crossed here at one zero. And it should have gone through the point to one and then gone up from there. But if I take that graph and I shift it to the left by one, then I would have this graph here, which is B. Now, how do I know it's B and not C? Well, it should have been going through the point to one. If I pull that to the left, 
then it should be going through one, one. So maybe it is C. Hmm. So it is in fact C. So we have to be careful and make sure that we're shifting the right one. It's got to go left by one, okay? So this one would actually be graph C. All right, let's take a look at this graph. This one is the natural log of negative X. The negative is inside the answer part. It's multiplied by X. So it's one of those more difficult horizontal reflections. So let's think about what we normally would have here. So we would normally have the graph coming up natural log and it would go up like this. And it would go through this point here, which would be one zero. And then over here somewhere would be the point um, E one, okay? Something like that. This is the parent function, natural log of X equal to Y. That's the parent function. Now, what about this one? What's happened? We've reflected across the Y axis. So we're gonna make a mirror image of this that's going the other way. So it should be coming up and going out like this. So this point right here, which was at one zero, should now be reflected and it should be at negative one zero. And this point that was here at E comma one, which is about 2.7 comma one, has been reflected to the left. So it should be out here at, make sure I'm the right distance, should be out here at negative E one, right? So when the value is the same as the base, we should have a one. And in this case, it gets reflected. So if we're looking at the graphs, C and D are definitely out. That's the black graph and the red graph. So those are definitely not correct because they're coming down, right? That would have been a vertical reflection. But because it's inside the answer part multiplied by X, it's a horizontal reflection. So it's affecting X. So it's got to be either the blue graph A or the green graph B. Both of these go through the ordered pair negative one, zero. So that's not going to help me. The question is which one most closely goes through about negative 2.71. So if I find the line for one and I see where they each intersect, well, I can't even get the green one to intersect. But notice that the blue is coming down here and it's crossing at about negative 2.7. In other words, it's crossing out there at negative E, right? My negative E looks a little weird. Let's fix that, right? So it's crossing out there at about negative E, right? So it's got to be graph A, right? Again, this is rather difficult to do sometimes, and students find this very difficult. So don't hesitate to go ahead and graph it in Desmos or some other graphing utility and look at the picture and then make sure that you can understand why it is the way it is. Okay. Let's take a look at this graph. This is log base has to be 10 of three plus X. Now it's written that way, but again, because it is addition on the inside and addition is commutative, I can always write it as X plus three, which it just makes me a little bit happier. And this is the equation for Y. So again, I'm looking at this. If I look at the domain, I know that X plus three has to be strictly positive. If I move the three, that means that X is greater than negative three which means that when I do my number line, I've got negative three down here, zero here, an empty circle at negative three, but the variable X is on the wide end of the symbol. So I still go to the right, which means that I have from negative three to infinity. So my graph should be starting around negative three, close to negative three, not including negative three and moving to the right. That eliminates the green graph, which is not starting actually until um, x equal two, and the red graph, which is approaching x equal zero, and also the black graph, which is approaching x equal negative two. 
The only one it could possibly be is A, the blue graph. That's the only one that's even a possibility. Right? So this one is graph A. All right, we have one more problem to look at. Now, this one is much more difficult to conceptualize. We are going to learn better ways of solving this one, algebraic ways of solving this one. But how can we solve this one now before we have those algebraic skills? Before that, what this is saying is that this equation right here is equal to this equation right here. In other words, y equals log, base must be 10 because they wrote L-O-G without a base, of 5x minus 5 plus 3 and the graph of y equals 2 minus log, base again must be 10, of 5x minus 5 again. I'm looking for the place where these two curves cross each other. Where are they at the same place at the same time? What ordered pair do they have in common? What's the point of intersection? So there are a couple of ways of doing this, and I'm going to give you a couple of options. My favorite, of course, is still to use Desmos. So I'm going to come here, and I'm going to click on the Desmos graph so that you can see how I solve this. So the first thing I did was I graphed the left side of the equation, it's one. And if you're bothered because I didn't put equals y, you can always add equals y, it's not gonna change it. And this of course would give me the normal logarithm graph. Now it's been, I've got a stretch factor in the horizontal direction, which we have not talked about. And then I've got a shift to the right and a shift up. So you can see that the graph, yeah, it's shifted right up. Okay, it looks okay. And then what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna turn on the graph for the right side of the equation, the original equation, and we can see that one here. Now this one is coming down like this because it is multiplied by a negative outside of the logarithm, which reflects it vertically across the x-axis. So it's gotten turned upside down. So what I'm looking for is where they intersect. So I'm going to put both of them on here and Desmos wants me to click on that spot. So I'm gonna click on that spot and I get about 1.063, which is great, except your homework system maybe wants four decimal places, which is not so great. So what are you gonna do if it wants four decimal places? Well, I don't know if you scrolled in, if that would help any, I don't think so. I don't think you're ever gonna get more than just that much right there. Now you're just gonna get that much. But there are some other online calculators that will help you do it, and Wolfram Alpha is one. So you can Google Wolfram Alpha, and you spell it with a W-O-L-F-R-A-M space alpha. Google that, and it will pop right up. So let's take a look at this one, this version of it. So when you Google Wolfram Alpha, it looks like this, and you get this sort of orange rectangle that we see here in the middle and you can see the Wolfram Alpha. And you can enter the equation for the whole thing as is. And you can see that once you enter it in, you can press on the equals to compute the output. And it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna give you an exact result down here. And then it's gonna show you on the graph about where it is right there. So it shows you graphically the same thing that we saw on Desmos. And when you come down here, it gives you the actual solution. Now notice this solution, of course, is an irrational number because of the square root of 10, but WebWork maybe, or whatever system you're using wants a decimal number. If you click on the decimal, or you click on that right there, it will give it to you out to way more decimal places than what you need. So you can see um, the approximation of that there, the 1.063, goes on to 24555320336 and so on, right? So there are different ways of producing the solutions to these equations. Now, again, we're gonna learn a better way of doing this later on um, when we use algebra to solve these kinds of equations. In our next video, we'll be starting with some of the properties of logarithms and starting to 
um, resolve some of these problems algebraically. I hope you'll join me for that video.